History is full of warriors and generals who led armies in battle and brought down mighty empires. Julius Caesar, Genghis Khan, Napoleon, Lando. But revolutions need more than military strategy. They need inspiration. They need heart. What if I told you revolutions may be fought with generals and armies, but sometimes they start with ophthalmologists? Today's illustrative example is the propaganda movement in the Philippines. What up, I'm Ben Freeman from Freemanpedia.com, where I try to translate AP World History Modern to people like you all around the world. And today we focus on the other side of the world, specifically the reforms that the Filipinos pushed for in the late 19th century, known to history as the propaganda movement. But it's way too early for me to be throwing words at you like Katapunin and Nolimi Tangare. Let's get some context. You can't randomly show me pictures of a doctor being shot in the back by a firing squad and be like, he died for all Filipinos. That's a lot to process. You gotta put this doctor and his propaganda movement into the greater historical context. It's the Star Wars crawl. All the Star Wars films from the Skywalker saga start with one of these crawls. It happens before any action or dialogue. It puts all the action of what you're about to see into some context. This way, you know what's going on in the Star Wars world when the lightsaber starts sabering. You need to do this with your essays. Before you start swinging your lightsaber of historical content, put it into the greater historical context so that it makes sense to someone reading your essay. All right, one minute on the clock. Okay, I got this. Just connect the execution of one of the greatest minds of the 19th century and his martyrdom for the Filipino push for equality to the greater nationalism movements of the 19th century. AP World History's third period spans from 1750 to 1900. And within that time period, they break it down into two units. Unit five is called Revolution. This one's all about the political and economic revolutions that transformed the earth in this period. The second unit is Unit six, Consequences of Industrialization, which is just code for imperialism. That industrialization you cover in Unit five has such a major impact on the world that Unit six is all about the consequences of that industrialization. For imperialism. But today we are completely focused on Unit 5, and not the Industrial Revolution with its technologies and factories and production. Rather, we're going to talk about 5.2, Nationalism and Revolutions. Your teacher is no doubt going to hyper-focus on the political revolutions. Your Washingtons, your Bolivars, your Robespierres, your Louvertures. Those are movements where people rose up and overthrew the governments that were oppressing them. But don't sleep on the nationalist movements. The College Board gives you six illustrative examples here, but this one is definitely my favorite. So today we zero in on the Philippines and the propaganda movement. We can't start unless we at least briefly talk about what nationalism is. Nationalism is just the idea that you and your people who share a common culture, ethnicity, language, religion, or traditions should rule yourselves or have what we in history classes call sovereignty. And thanks to all those empires we built back in Unit 4, in this period there's a long line of people looking to gain themselves some of that sovereignty. And for today's illustrative example, that's the Filipinos. They've been under Spanish rule since the Filipino Lapu Lapu took a spear upside the head of Magellan back in the 1500s. But it's not until the end of this period, in the late 1800s, when the Filipinos put out a call for equality to their Spanish colonizers in a movement known as historically as the propaganda movement. See, what had happened was uh, I couldn't really see things because my ophthalmologist is just some lady at the mall and not Dr. Jose Rizal, one of the greatest polymaths of all time. So maybe if he had worked on my eyes, I could have seen it a little better and then maybe done it on time. Anyways, keep it short and make sure you explore the greater historical context of the topic you're talking about. Enough context, let's talk about the example. Come on. Today we head to the other side of the planet, to the 13th largest country in the world, the Philippines. This is where we find the propaganda movement and our hero, Jose Rizal. In general, the Filipino propaganda movement was a call for equality by the Filipinos to the Spanish who'd been ruling over them since Magellan in the 1500s. Honestly, it's the worst name thing ever because if you're like me and you hear the word propaganda and you think of some misleading information, someone's trying to make you think one way or another to their cause, right? But in reality, the propaganda movement here is countering Spanish propaganda. It should be called the counter-propaganda movement, but it's not. It's called the propaganda movement. So just know it's not actual propaganda. It's countering Spanish propaganda about the Filipinos in the Philippines. But the best way to look at the propaganda movement is to focus in on its leader, Jose Rizal. Jose Rizal was born the same year the Civil War started, 1861. One of 11 kids, he descended from Filipinos and Chinese ancestors who'd been living in diaspora in the Philippines since the 
Manchu invasions back in Unit 3. Shortly before he was born, Spain had just opened schools for Filipinos to attend, and Jose Rizal thrived in school. You know that one kid in class who's good at everything, in sports, and art, and uh, video games, and girls, and everything else, and you hate him, and he's going to Harvard? Yeah, that's Jose Rizal. He's what we call a polymath. A polymath is someone who's good at everything. And Jose Rizal excelled at everything. Painting, sketching, sculpting, wood carving, poetry, essays, novels, cartography, martial arts, fencing. Dude spoke 22 languages. I can't name 22 languages. So when he leaves the Philippines to go continue his studies in Spain, it's no surprise that he excels there as well. He goes there to study Spanish law in hopes that he can take those newfound skills back to the Philippines and use it to defend his people. But when he finds out his mother is going blind, he switches studies to ophthalmology. So maybe one day he could return to the Philippines and help his mother who was going blind. This is a tool that might help him later. The most important thing he did in Europe was write the novel Noli Me Tangere, which means touch me not. It's about a mixed race heir of a wealthy clan returning home to the Philippines after studying in Europe only to find resistance from Spanish and church officials. Does that sound familiar? This book is such a big deal that they passed a law back in 1956 that all Filipinos have to read this book at some point in high school. It's a law. So if you know someone who grew up in the Philippines, they've definitely read this book. All of his novels and essays catapult him to the forefront of the reform movement in the Philippines that comes to be known as the propaganda movement. So he returns home to the Philippines as a hero of the people, but as an enemy of the Spanish imperial government. When he gets back, first stop, cured his mom's cataracts. Told you those skills would be helpful. Next stop, cure the oppression of the Spanish on his homeland. So let's put this in the context of other movements in this period. The propaganda movement was not radical like the Jacobins or even separatists like the Sons of Liberty. Their demands were simple. One, representation in the Spanish parliament. Technically, the Philippines were a part of New Spain and were actually being ruled from Mexico City and not from Madrid, far away from the more sympathetic intellectuals of Madrid. Two, equality of the Spanish and the Filipinos. Three, a guarantee of basic freedoms. Four, an end to the labor service, where all Filipino males aged 16 to 60 owed 40 days of government service each year. The propaganda movement wanted to put an end to this. So it's a movement about equality. The Filipinos just wanted to be equal to the Spanish. So during the struggle, our hero Jose Rizal is captured by the Spanish and blamed for organizing a violent revolution, which he truly had no part in. They decided to make an example of him and he was executed by firing squad on December 30th, 1896. Through his writings, he was able to end Spain's moral control of the Filipino people. His death made him a martyr to the cause of the liberation of the Filipino people. That movement that Rizal was executed for organizing continued to fight the Spanish up until the point where the Spanish lost to the Americans in the Spanish-American War. The Philippines did not gain full independence from the United States until after World War II in 1946. Was that too long? Did you not watch? Let me recap for you. I pointed out that even ophthalmologists can start rebellions. I failed to contextualize in under a minute because my eye doctor is not a polymath like Jose Rizal. We focused on Unit 5.2, Nationalism and Revolutions, and more specifically, the Philippine propaganda movement led by Jose Rizal. We saw how this polymath's writings and actions led for a push for equality between the Spanish and Filipinos known as the propaganda movement. Okay, thanks again for watching. I'm Ben Freeman from Framepedia.com. The holiday season is quickly approaching, and if you're looking for a stocking stuffer or something for your dorky history teacher, you could do a lot worse than the Framepedia hoodie. Get yours below in comments. All right, good luck on the exam, and man, I'll see you next time. Thank you.